Hello, welcome again to TWF. Uh, today we're going to be talking about post-apocalyptic fiction. And I feel fine. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, joining me once again, John Sale and Sean Hutchings. So, post-apocalyptic fiction, a very big area yeah. that we can talk about. So, one of the things we were talking about before the vlog uh, started, before the recording started, how we define apocalypse. Yes. Uh, so, perhaps we, we look at any event, uh, either man-made or external, that either destroys a significant or overwhelming majority of population, but primarily will overthrow a civilization. Yes, yes. the collapse of the social norm, the yes. world as we know it, rather than the end of the planet. Indeed. So, are there any apocalypse that you might write or you might be creating in your world? There are going to be survivors, one hopes. Otherwise, yes. how else are you going to tell a story? Actually, that may be very interesting. If anybody wants to send one in, we'll <laughs> not to read it. Oh, I don't know. I'd have a read. There have been some. Uh, consider, for instance, Planet of the Apes. Mm. If, however, you're going to do that, you're going to be looking at non-human yeah. human analogues. Which is an interesting point in its own right. Yeah, but we'll uh, come to that later. Yes. Uh, for the main part, then, let's say we are looking at our own world. We're looking at the overthrow of our civilization mm. as the world, or indeed even just significant consonants. So, survivors, um, how big does a group have to be? Can you have a solo survivor? Can you have a group of survivors? Does it matter too much? Yes, I think it colours the type of story. It shapes your story very much. Uh, if we look at The Road, Cormac McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Two survivors, man and boy. It's a survival narrative, and it is very bleak. <laughs> Beautifully so. I mean, yes. this is standard of Cormac McCarthy's novels. They, mm. You don't feel good about them, but they're so beautiful. On the other hand, if you have multiple survivors, you have avenues for humour, you have avenues for rebuilding as mm -hmm. opposed to merely surviving. Mm. Generally speaking, I would say that the majority of post-apocalyptic fiction in which you have a group of survivors, a large group, mm -hmm tends to be about ethnogenesis, which is the rise of a new social order yeah, from sure. the ashes of the old one. Okay. This was done rather neatly in the Day of Driffords, mm -hmm. which the whole second part of the novel is the, after Bill Mason has stopped wandering around by himself, to a concerted effort to try and reconstruct um, society, but through two bands of people who have two very different ideas on how so this is the interesting thing about the survivors of a apocalyptic catastrophe start to show the, either their true colours or they undergo a massive change of personality because of it. Okay, so when we're talking then, rather than a survival story, let's look at a group of survivors. Okay. There's a huge difference then, though, between group, different groups of survivors. You can have small communities, maybe 10, maybe 15 people. You could have... You can go all the way up to the whole continent, more or less surviving, but yeah. it's after a terrible event, uh, a la Hunger Games, for example. Um, so, where is there any particular size of surviving population that you that you you guys would suggest is better or is more useful? I think it depends entirely on what kind of story you want to tell. Uh, I mean, the thing is, if you start with a small group of survivors. But that's all there is, and that is eventually going to die out by sure. just simply mm. not having a, a deep enough gene pool. So you, so you assume that viable. there are other groups of survivors. Mm -hmm. And the thing with ethnogenesis is, Group A behaves in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, they are successful, they continue to survive. Other survivors, solo survivors, small groups, see Group A, wish to join Group A. They adopt Group A's behaviour because that is successful behaviour in the new post-apocalyptic reality sure. and that is how you get a group of survivors turns into a tribe, turns into a nation mm -hmm. uh, which is a very different story to man and boy trudging through the mm. ash-littered wasteland sure. I suppose quite a bit of it depends on what is the nature of this catastrophe so how, how big a group of survivors is realistic I mean, if you have a natural disaster and food is not a great option, you may want to keep it relatively trim. Same as if there's a plague and the chance of infection, you get the healthy people together and anybody who comes into that for the safety of the established group must be Isolated, removed. Yeah. So it's that conflict between 
a group that would be planning for the future and rebuilding or a group of people that is essentially just a five or ten, say, um, survival narrative. So we're talking about then having massive scope. If you've got an individual, then you've got the, uh, the, the or a smaller number, two, three maybe, you've got the opportunity for survival narratives. If you're mm. talking about larger groups, depending on the science, you've got a huge play set for you mm. to go, right, well, I can do this or I can do this. In Absolutely. your example of group A, outsiders coming in, you've also got the idea of, well, how long before that new those newcomers are trusted, how long before they're accepted, mm. what do they have to do to get them kicked out again? Or what happens if one or two of them are separated and mm. kicked out because one person has the useful thing and the others are just mouths to feed? So you have a massive scope, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, I'm referring to my notes, so I must apologise here. But you said about the type of apocalypse. So uh, how does the type of apocalypse, so for example, a viral apocalypse, where some people, for whatever reason, have an immunity or have the ability to survive mm. the symptoms of the virus, uh, how is that different, would you say, to, for example, a war which would devastate a continent or a, or a civilization or indeed an entire world? Availability of useful materials for starters. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have, for instance, a massive nuclear exchange, you've got radioactive groundwater, you've got entire cities have been destroyed, you've got electronic items that appear to be intact but in fact will never function even if you can find electricity because the EMP, EMP has fried the circuits. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've got a world that has been blasted absolutely back to the bedrock, for example. Now, on the other hand, if you take something like I don't know, the Black Plague, mm -hmm. but you say instead of killing 50% of the population, it kills 99% of the population, then you've got a massively smaller population, social order, society will cease to exist. Mm -hmm. But you have abundant food, you have fresh water, you have a world full of electronic goods and cars and petrol and refined oil, etc., etc. You just need to be able to find these things. So again, that can alter the nature of the narrative. A narrative where, for instance, fresh water is incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. People will be much more likely to fight over that fresh water. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if there are abundant foodstuffs, water, etc., then interpersonal conflict is not as likely. But, I mean, if you're talking about uh, sort of the idea that water, for example, is a very valuable commodity, yes, mm. but there are technologies that we as human beings have developed in the past and now that you can use to refine that. So you, mm. you do have options. It's not like, okay, Group A is being attacked for their water stocks. Group A's water stocks are taken away. It seems to be the pattern of uh, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction to show how um, fickle and fragile the technological world is that once and it's social gone, order. and social order. Mm. I mean, in um, what seems to be a staple of it is the, what I'm going to have to refer to as the, the king and the castle mentality. In most of the apocalyptic fiction I've read, there tends to be that one person or group of people who goes goes native, goes like Kert in uh, Heart of Darkness. He's um, Torrance in the David Triffords, who has World his own flies. same same principle. In, have you read World War Z? Yes. The yeah. principle of the last man on earth syndrome, where they start to build their own little things and aren't really that happy when society starts to be rebuilt. Mm. So we seem to have this pattern of the survivors wanting to hold on to the remnants of this fickle and fragile world, despite the fact that clearly didn't work, um, and to try and rebuild something that is in that basic shape. Well, I mean, if we look at the real world then, uh, it was something we briefly discussed before we started filming, was this idea that there are things we can learn from natural disasters and from wars that we have had, or uh, external incidents, for example, yes. the meltdown at Chernobyl or what have you. The other things do you think that we can learn from those things and apply them to our writing, things that we can expand on or elaborate and go, well, this is what happens in the real world. What will happen if that happen, if, if that kind of incident happens on a larger scale? Mm. And what would, what would you say about that? Well, firstly, you can have a look at the breakdown of what is considered to be socially acceptable. Mm. I mean, if you 
consider the notion nobody particularly enjoys the thought of eating dogs and cats and rats. But we've seen it happen, look at Stalingrad mm -hmm. in relatively recent history. Uh, lawlessness in a variety of occasions. We can look at the breakdown of physical infrastructure over time. So, for mm -hmm. instance, we can look to, is it Pripyat in Chernobyl? I think so. The Red Forest area. That's right. Yeah. There's very famous pictures. You've got the, uh, the Ferris wheel and mm. things. Mm. Yes, so yes. we can actually see what an abandoned city sure. looks like. Mm. Yeah. We can look to history. We can see what happens when the social order breaks down, mm. uh, when, when we lose civilization. Mm. I suppose um, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction is very good at tapping into the fears of that time period. This is largely why, um, just to skip ever so slightly sideways for a moment, invasion literature becomes such a big deal at the end of the 19th century, especially in Britain. I mean, it's. I think there was a year leap between the Battle of Dorking and the War of the Worlds. It's very good at examining what that time and place is scared of. If you take the, a more modern example of World War Z, it's our lack of preparedness. That mm. is a word, isn't it? I'm just calling yes. that. Yeah, okay. Our lack of preparedness in the face of an unknown threat that we are um, safe and secure. And apocalyptic writers are very, very fond of, eh, no, you're not at all. Mm. Had to have you looking for the monster under your bed. But I mean, at the same rate, looking at, say, the individual survivor, my, my thoughts are drawn to, there is, a, is he, was he Japanese? A Japanese pilot went down in uh, the Philippines. Are you thinking about the gentleman who died recently? I think, yes, he did. He, he wasn't he, a pilot, he was military intelligence. Oh, uh, he, he was sent to the island specifically with orders not to surrender. Yes, and, he's, he, and he managed he to surrender. survive for something like, well, well. Over 30 years, I think he, he they dug his commanding officer out of retirement to go into the forest to the island yeah. to give him properly issued orders not to even to surrender but to cease combat operations yeah uh, in 1974 I think oh, that was. was but the, the fact is this was he ended up in that jungle uh, during the Second World War for 30 odd years he survived uh, you know that's actually something that we as writers can look at and go well, okay, he survived. How did he do it? And there were three of them. Uh, One died in a shootout with the Philippine police. Right. One surrendered. And he was the last. Okay. See, the, that, that's something I didn't so, know. So the I'm real world just throws these marvellous templates. Yeah. Um, with, in terms of architecture and supplementary details and the hows and whys and wherefores. Mm. It's very good at giving us that. But then you get into the human element of it. You examine... What apocalypse, what, if you want to look at the collapse of civilization, what civilization am I going to collapse here and how? Mm. Because that thing, that kind of thing lasts. One of it, I'm going to pick up something I've been talking about for a while, um, a book by J.G. Ballard called The Drowned World. It was written in the 1960s. Um, solar radiation has fluctuated massively and the planet over a 30 year um, period is slowly turn, turned back into Triassic conditions. It starts off in London and it's a drowned city. The buildings are slowly sinking, it's tropical, it's equatorial um, in Britain, yeah. as a part of ice, ice caps melt. But what's happening to the people is they're being haunted by what they initially think of bad dreams and heat stroke. They're hearing voices and seeing shapes, and everyone's having these very similar dreams. And it examines the idea that since the world has gone back to a primeval state, their genetic memory is starting to realign. And that their, their fundamental humanity is changing to match the new world they're in. So playing on the, the human ability to... Yeah, oh, the, so the, here's an apocalypse where you're not safe even inside your own head. Mm. About halfway through it, and I'll lend it to either of you. <laughs> it's absolutely oh, marvelous. Yes, it's his first novel, so it's a bit. We'll put a recommendation in yeah. the links below as well. But um, the reason I mention this is because talking about templates from the real world, um, JJ Ballard grew up in uh, Shanghai, mm. and the images of the, 
the drowned city and the iguanas and the bats is based on the rainy season of Shanghai and the on the wars down the streets and the reptiles and the ferns. It's based on his childhood memories of the searing heat of those summers. So he's taken that emotional stimulus from his memory and he's applied it to a planetary scale. Mm. So, yeah, I would totally agree in saying that real world events and images are really marvellous moulds to cast the end of the world in to yeah. bring the whole damn thing down. But interestingly enough, they can also provide templates that the characters will draw on. Mm. So if we look, for instance, at S.M. Sterling's Dives, Dives of Fire, all post-industrial technology ceases to work. Okay. Uh, and we have a variety of survivors, one of whom is a Wiccan and does so very much with a, a commune attitude within her coven and drawing people in. One of whom is a former US Marine NCO who was flying a engineer when the power went out and he had to basically belly flop the plane into a, fl into a stream. <laughs> And one of whom was a medieval reenactment specialist with oh, a PhD you. specialism in the Norman period. <laughs> that is handy. Yeah, <laughs> you that want, you want to yeah. find that guy, don't you? And I just did that he, thing. Of he draws on his knowledge of the Normans and how the Normans did it, which involves basically impressing people into serfdom, putting mm. people in plate or scale mail. Mm. Uh, and being really handy with long, sharp, pointy things. So, and he, it works for him, but he is, unsurprisingly, the villain of the piece. Well, naturally. I mean, on the back of the idea that we can learn things, uh, you mention he, uh, your Norman uh, reenactment uh, character picks up all these ideas, this is how they did it then. Well, you've also got this idea that in archaeology, there's this uh, sort of theory that says, that we were more effective and less wasteful as a society or as a civilization of humans when we were not sedentary, when we moved around from place to place, mm. when we were hunted together, when we did have maybe seasonal camps. I mean, that's something else that we can look at and go, well, actually, you know, there are things that we can learn and we can with a, if a civilization or a new community mm. after a post apocalyptic world. If they are going to survive, they are going to have to become, they're going to have to go where the resources are. Yes. So do we look into history and go, well, that's a way of doing it. That's a way of getting yeah. around these problems. It's an interesting Darwinian approach because, say, this was a novel based at this moment, 2014. I'd like to see who these... There's a very small amount of a population that could very easily shake off their sedentary lifestyle and could take up this obvious solution. So it really is a case of survival of the fittest on a very blunt and immediate scale. And by that I mean however long it takes somebody to starve to death. Mm. So just then you've, you're cutting the chafe, aren't you? Yeah. One thing that occurs to me, I mean it's interesting you're talking about hunter-gatherers uh, and the efficiency thereof. There was a study that suggested, I've seen studies, several of them, the lowest estimate was that hunter-gatherers worked 21 hours a week. Which is quite interesting, actually, that... That we work longer hours in order to survive, absolutely. In theory, um, it's 40, but how many of us have worked 100-hour weeks? Mm. I'm sure most of us... But on the one hand, you might have, certainly, a year after the apocalypse, you might have survivors mm. who can do that, and yeah. they can move around, they can go where the food is, and they can work 21 hours a week, and everything's lovely. But a hunter-gatherer lifestyle does not provide any form of technological infrastructure. So if you then run afoul of another group of survivors who have reverted to a more advanced historical template mm. and they do have an infrastructure and they decide for whatever reason that they are in competition with you. We've managed to find a nice stand of yew trees and we're going to make some fantastically great bows and mm. we're going to keep you from a range. Precisely. Uh, so, and again, this is one of the other things that you will find in historical fiction. Going back to Dies of Fire and more generally the Emberverse mm. of S.M. Sterling, uh, you find a collision of historical periods. So, you have one group of survivors who are very Celtic based, uh, probably from a, a comparable time period to the Norman Armager. 
the Norman uh, yeah, the, yeah. fellow. Uh, you have the fellows led by the US Marines, who through a variety of expertise within their group, which is often very important to the narrative with groups of survivors, they've adopted a fairly Mongol approach, so they are horse archers who can also use lances. Mm -hmm. You have the United States of Boys, uh, who have adopted Roman techniques. Which is all quite, it's like quite interesting actually the way, you, the way it's broken down then, because the, the part of me that sort of has looked into bits of history is going, well actually you've got horse archers and you, you did have them coming up against the Romans, so how is that going to play out? If you've mm. got those two styles, you can, what we were talking about earlier, go directly into history and go, how did that battle between them go? But then we occasionally run into some rather unexpected things. So there is one group of survivors in that who, several years down the line, have levied infantry mm. uh, with breakdown pikes on bicycles. <laughs> okay. Because the road system's there. Yeah. Mm. So they can get on their bikes, they can move at a rate that would have been inconceivable a thousand years ago and then dismount, put the pikes together, and... and that's, that is, actually, that's fantastic. I'm gonna have to... You kind of want the world to end now, just so you can have a <laughs> No, no, not necessarily. It's just, it's, just a look, it's that thing of, actually, how wonderful a concept is that. I mm. love that. Uh, so yeah. really we can see that it's not so much a case of sitting down and saying, how am I going to end the world today? It's when it's It turns out that the end is very much just the beginning, your in problem will start then. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Unless, again, you are talking about a very small group and a survival narrative. Mm -hmm. But this goes back to what I was saying. Post-apocalyptic post fiction is largely about ethnogenesis. It's mm. not about the fall of civilization. it's about building it back up. Mm. Well, I mean, on, on the back of that, you've got uh, the minimal, minimum sustainable population, which, of course, is something you get when you're looking at space colonies or any kind of colonies. But actually, it occurs to me that that's going to be quite important as well in any post-apocalyptic mm. fiction setting, yes. where you have any sizable number of humans. What size is necessary? And, I, I remember you talking uh, quite a while back about you know minimal st sustainable populations, but how big do you guys think you would have you you would need? It's if if you were going to create your society, how big would you create it? Do you think? And again, initially um, you can start with a very small group if you assume that there are other groups of survivors around. If you're talking about a grand total who are going to be interbreeding. Mm then your geneticists are still arguing about this. I've heard some people say that you could probably perpetuate the species with less than a thousand people. Mm. Other people say that, you know, actually you need thousands upon thousands. Mm. What was it the, the last time to check the extinction crisis in the Rift Valley when we were still Africa bound, brought the human population down to about 3,000 perhaps? Maybe significantly less, but around 3,000. 3,000 individual uh, human beings, and that's all there was on the planet. And here we are with how many billion? Five? Is it? Seven. We're I think going to hit the seven billion in the next very, few years. Uh, if, if not, we already so, have. Yeah. And that's in two million years, from 3,000 to um, seven billion unstable population yeah. uh, two million years later. Indeed. I mean, well, if we move away from, for a moment, the group survival situation, the lone survivor, of course, you've got some great examples. Of, you know, you mentioned World War Z. My personal favourite is Iron Legend. Yeah. Matheson. I, I, it's a novel I absolutely adore, if only because the image of of him painting onto the wall this lovely scene of whatever and listening to music while the while the hordes are at his door bashing in. It's a wonderful place. How different do you think that kind of thing is? I mean, is there anything about the individual survivor story that Technically, we as writers yeah. need to need to keep in mind. I think he seems the lone survivor is kind of an inversion of the Conradian narrator, the uh, who is within and without the peripheral narrator, I should say, who, or, or he, 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 excuse me, he doesn't willingly remove himself from society to examine it from the outside. He's all that's left, mm -hmm. and the lone survivor character tends to be very. Um, retrospective, he thinks an awful lot of what came before. I'm thinking, has anybody seen the film um, The Age of Stupid? Pete Postlethwaite. Yeah. It was an environmental documentary about how we're slowly screwing up the planet, but it was framed 
we're based a few hundred years in the future and Pete Postlethwaite plays um, a curator of a museum in the ruined world and he's the last man on earth and he's putting together this um, little digital museum to send out into mm. space if it may be of benefit to anybody else who's out there. But again, Lone Survivor, very retrospective thinking of all that came before in the day of the Triffords, how Bill Mason walks around ruined London. In the last chapter of the War of the Worlds is called Dead London and takes in, oh, and there was that. It becomes almost like your grandfather saying, and I remember when this was there, and I remember when there weren't aliens over there, and you wouldn't get burnt to death down there. It's very um, nostalgic almost. It's darkly nostalgic. And I think that's... It shouldn't be a defining thing of a character, and I think that's something you might fall into. Do you think then, I mean, looking at the examples I've read, certainly, do you think it's a more immediate narrative that you end up telling? It, it's A lone character has priorities that are going to have to be fulfilled uh, a lot. I'm not phrasing it very well, but there are priorities that that character will need to, to fulfill very quickly, whereas if you've got a big group or you've got any sizable group, the, the sort of survival, uh, the basics of survival, your food, your water, your shelter, your security, they're not going to be as, um, they're going to be shared, the load is going to be shared, whereas with a lone survivor, mm. you're going to have somebody who's got to do everything himself. And so you might have somebody who, there's no need to be retrospective. Everything is about, okay, what else am I needing to do today? I yeah. need to make sure the water's still there. In I Am Legend, he's checking his food stocks every day. He's well, this shoring the up the house the, um, every single day. All his priorities, road, yeah. whilst he does have the time to relax, all his priorities are going through his head and it's very, very, okay, this is what I need to do now. Now this I need to do. Now this. When he does get the moment, yes, he is retrospective and calm and now this is how it used to be. Yeah. But at the same time, you've well, got that. Was all fields, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but at, at the same time, you've also got the immediacy of these are the things I need to do now to ensure my continued. Yeah, that creates a wonderful tension in the character. It's a, it doesn't. It you really do feel because in I am Legend is a perfect example. The repetition and the tension really does get into the heart of the reader. Mm. You will find that to a degree with group survivors as well, though. Uh, just from the most surprising things. Bringing in the harvest. Will the weather hold off? Yeah. Uh, if you don't do that, you don't eat. So you do have a degree of that immediacy and that this is what I need to do, it mm. must absolutely be done now. And even within a group, if you have a group of, for instance, five, and you may have people who want to take what you have, then you need to have 24 hour security, which yeah. means that you're not getting enough sleep and you can do all this. Uh, but I will uh, agree that it's more prevalent yeah. in single survivor narratives. It puts a very particular set of demands on the character, uh, not just in terms of what they need to do, but who they need to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they are going to survive, if they are going to be a successful survivor. From a writing perspective, it also puts a lot of demands on the writer in terms of how do I make this a sustainable story when there is no one to talk to, there is no avenue for me to have the back and forth of dialogue. Mm -hmm. And that can be very, very hard to do. What I find interesting in the group survivor um, concept is the divisions within the group, the mm -hmm. clash of characters. Because if there's no structured society anymore, there's always a conflict of who is in charge. And the wonderful thing about post-apocalyptic fiction, as I mentioned before, is nobody is who they appear to be once civilization has collapsed. I come back to um, the, the Day of the Triffids because it's a personal favorite of mine, but um, the main character, Bill Mason, meets the closest thing the book has to an antagonist only three times. Mm over the stretch of the time of the book. First time he meets him, he's a drunk, he's just wandering around in the wastelands having a good time. Yeah. Second time he meets him, he's robbing a shop with a group of people, he's running up uh, an organised crime syndicate and just coldly shoots one of the blind survivors. The third time, the final time he meets him, he is calm, cool, fascistic overlord who is running his own um, ethnogenesis project further south 
So you see this transformation, and so to fit, if you took him on first impressions, he's just a drunk who is enjoying the last days on Earth. Well, I mean, you say that. Uh, there's a TV show, a reality TV show, American one, I came across uh, quite recently uh, called The Colony. Mm. And the, the conceit was that you had a group of people who would act as the survivors of an apocalypse, in this case, a viral apocalypse. Now, okay, reality TV, nothing is what it seems. They're very highly produced. They're, there is essentially a storytelling aspect to them. Uh, but you've got all these volunteers who ha come from different places. So you have the guy who is, who is, you see his name, and underneath, inventor. That was what his job was. You have another, you have a girl whose name comes up, model, glamour model, I think it was. And you, you have the inventor being very, you know, being very lazy and, oh, my back's hurting and I can't carry this and I can't carry that. But yet this is the guy who creates the forge for them to be able to create weapons, to be able to create the, the tools for hunting, for fixing the boat or what have you. Mm. You have the glamour model in this reality TV show, learning how to use power tools, learning how to use the tools that are being created, learning how to defend the colony. In fact, in, in the second season, one of these uh, one of the episodes, this this sort of thing, this this young girl gets taken away. She gets kidnapped by another group and ransomed for food. When she comes back, of course, you've got the opportunity for the producers, and I'm assuming it's the producers, being with it being a reality TV show, portraying her as a more toughened up character. Now, okay, yes, it's a reality TV show. Nothing's what it seems, but from a storytelling point of view, it fits right in with that. There are people who have skill sets beyond what you yeah. Would imagine. Yeah. Or uh, at least aptitudes. Yeah. Or, you know, that willingness to learn, for example, mm. is a trait you could have that turns that prissy glamour model into a fantastically useful member of that society, which is an interesting mm. idea to play about for a character. But of course, there's a gulf between the types of survivor, which is those who earn their right to survive by being a doctor who is clever enough to vaccinate himself. Or the people who are just lucky, like yeah. being in hospital with your eyes bound up and you don't see the meteor shower that blinds all of humanity. So, <laughs> is there a preference between them? Is one better than the other? Luck or I, earning your right to survive? I don't know that it's that it one's any better than the other. I'd say it gives you that opportunity there seems, to tell... There seems to be a very definite, definite um, strike between them. There's yeah. this kind and this kind. And one may meet others of the different, but... yeah. So there seems to be these two kinds of survivors, pure bloody luck and those who worked actively against this. From a writing point of view, are yeah. all these perfect? From a writing point of view, the person who survives via luck has the advantage of being an everyman character. Yeah. yeah. On I'll the other hand... Dwarf. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's, no, no, it's a, it's a good example. On the other hand, uh, you have lottery winning luck and you survive the apocalypse. Mm. But then society is gone, and you have no special skills, mm. and the next day you've got to be lucky all over again, and the day after that, and the day after mm. that. Do we think of luck as a trait Napoleon wanted to know? That I don't want to know if he's good, I want to know if he's lucky. Mm. Is luck a trait? It's an interesting question. It, is. it really is. That's it, why I raised it. I was hoping somebody could answer it. I don't think any it. of us have the absolute answer. <laughs> I don't think there is. But it's a great thing to bear in mind, I think, when you're writing. Uh, I think we should probably wrap up shortly. Okay. But before we do, one final question is that we raised I Am Legend and a few other things. Post-apocalyptic fiction, there is huge scope for it to be cross-genre. Yeah. So, arguably, I Am Legend is not just post-apocalyptic, but it's also zombie, maybe vampire, vampire yeah. fiction. It's kind of, it's oh, a great the area. survivor is actually the monster. Yes, case. yeah. So it's, uh, you know, I think you said earlier before we started recording, it could be a horror novel almost. Mm. Uh, there's a huge scope. I mean, would you both agree? Absolutely. I mean, I'd, I've read quite a bit of horror apocalypse and science fiction apocalypse. I'd love to read fantasy apocalypse if anybody can recommend that. <laughs> I, I, I fancy Apocalypse, I'd be very interested be in that. But I don't think there's any real... If you've, got, if you've created another world, mm. just to name drop the name of the vlog, um, you can end it yeah. in any way you can. But mm, as long as it's not just for the sake of doing that. It's not like, ah, oh, I don't end it. Much as C.S. Lewis did when he brought Narnia to an end. Mm, yeah. 
I've got a suspicion, amusingly enough, that Fantasy Apocalypse has been done. I, I'd be surprised if it hadn't. I've just never. By the D and D franchise, of all things. Uh, well, that's worth for Google when I get Yeah, out. I think so. Uh, you've got your multiple cataclysms of Kryn in the Dragonlance saga. Mm. Uh, there was a series in which the gods were cast out from heaven and forced to walk the earth in Faerun in the Forgotten Realm saga. I think there may have been a couple more of them, actually. Well, that's, that's something that's to that go and look at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks, gents. Um, thank you very much for those of you who've been watching. If you like the video or any of the videos on TWF, please consider uh, clicking the subscribe button and sharing the videos with as many people as you can. Uh, please. Yes. Please. Uh, Sean Hutchings and John Sell once again. Uh, I'm Martin. Thank you very much for watching. See you again. Bye-bye.